Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Hiram Cortez. I am president of the uh, Crew Latinx Alumni Association with the Alumni Association of Case Western Reserve University. And it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight for this event. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, firstly, I wanted to say we hope that you and your loved ones are healthy and safe uh, right now. And um, before we begin, I'd also like to give a few housekeeping notes. So everyone is muted by default right now, but you do have the ability to unmute yourselves for the question and answer uh, portion of the program later on. But for now, uh, please remain muted to limit background noise during the presentations from the speakers tonight. So that you, so that we know who you are, please also make sure your name appears correctly in the in the meeting. You can rename yourself by clicking on participants at the bottom, finding your name, then using the more option and selecting to rename. I'll actually do that in a little bit myself to put my pronouns as well. And also finally, if you can, if you're able to, please turn on your video. We'd love to see your smiling faces, especially during right now this time of virtual living. And so I also have a few quick updates from, from campus from Case Western in case you haven't been uh, keeping up with everything. So the spring semester is underway with students studying in person, remotely, or a combination of those formats. Their safety and well-being has been the university's top, top priority and careful measures have allowed Case Western to continue its educational research priorities during this last year. In fact, in response to the pandemic, Cruz research has become vital to the fight against COVID and the university is doing a lot even on things like vaccine, vaccinations on campus. We also invite you to follow us on Facebook and the university's website case.edu slash together for regular updates on researchers, academics, alumni, and students. Additionally, in support of the ongoing conversation about race, equity, and social injustice in our country, Crew has launched a race policy, race police and protest website, and that is found at case.edu slash race and justice. So this website provides statements from university leadership and university resources, as well as the opportunity for members of the case community to share their thoughts. So the university acknowledges that the most, that acknowledges that that day's most profound questions require work and ongoing communication. So we look forward to, to sharing future progress through that website. At the Alumni Association of Case Western, uh, we continue to use our platforms to promote connections within the crew community and present information and opportunities that are available to all. To continue to engage with the case community, Make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. You can find us by searching Crew Alumni, at Crew Alumni. I'll throw in a, a plug for the Latinx Alumni Association Facebook page. You can find that on Facebook just by typing exactly that and, and you'll find it on there. And also please make sure to visit caves.edu slash alumni for a collection of current events and recordings of past programs that can be accessed at any time, including this event tonight that's being recorded. Now more than ever, we hope these virtual events and social media platforms will help us stay connected. So thank you for much for, for being here tonight as part of this event. So now a little bit about what we'll actually be talking about tonight. Tonight's presentation will focus on establishing your professional brand, creating connections, to effectively move your job search forward, optimizing your LinkedIn profile for improved networking and understanding how your LinkedIn profile is used in the market as LinkedIn is super important nowadays with you know, your career growth. We will also review Crew Connect, which is our customized platform to introduce you to thousands of crew students, faculty, staff and alumni for informational interviews and networking through Crew Connect. So at this point, it's my pleasure to welcome 
Laura Papcom and Lisa Herbert to um, the stage. And thank you so much for being here tonight. And I'll let y'all introduce yourselves. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Laura Papcom with the Office of Postgraduate Planning and Experiential Education. And I like to always remind people that is AKA the Career Center. Um, for those of you who don't know about our rebranding, as part of the Student Success Initiative, we rebranded the Career Center about two years ago now, um, knowing that when we worked with students, we weren't just working with students that were going immediately to a career, but many of them were doing a lot of postgraduate planning for medical school or dental school or a professional school of some sort, um, and or do continuing in research or just doing something other than career. And so we incorporated the pre-health advisor within our office, the pre-med advisor and the pre-law uh, advisor within our office, along with the source office. So to Hiram's point about research being so important, the student opportunities for undergraduate research and creative endeavors is now part of postgraduate planning and experiential education. And needless to say, they are very busy and the students are keeping them very busy as well. So my colleague, Lisa Abert, um, is not with us just yet. Uh, she was going to talk about networking and LinkedIn, uh, and I am going to talk about our Wiser platform. But before I begin, I would love to just wait a second and ask any of you, as we talk about networking, especially right now, it's really important and we'll talk about why, but does anybody have any questions that I can be sure to address as I'm talking? Please feel free to unmute yourself and um, I'd love to see your faces as well. All right, well, you've just given me permission just to keep on talking, so I love that. So let's just talk about the importance of networking. Again, it can be very uncomfortable. Uh, there are times that you say, I don't know what to talk to somebody about. I don't know how to network. And especially if you're more introverted, it's very hard to approach people and to have that conversation. But the beautiful thing is we've got wonderful resources like LinkedIn and like our Wiser platform, Crew Connect, the Alumni Career Network. And I'll tell you uh, about that if you're not familiar with it. If you are familiar, um, I'm going to show you a couple new additions to it that you might not be aware of. But just to give you some statistics, so I've been with Case since 2009. And so I came over to Case and the Career Center just as things were getting really, really bad. And my first summer at Case, I saw a lot of offers rescinded, a lot of our students coming back in tears because they were all set with their career and got the rug completely pulled out from under them with the recession. And while this economy doesn't seem to be as bad, there are a lot of similarities. We were fortunate just to give you a bit of an update about internships and co-ops and our seniors of 2020's opportunities. We really didn't lose a lot of opportunities. A lot of things weren't rescinded. Our employers just pivoted in the most amazing ways to create these wonderful online and remote programs for our interns and for our co-ops. Um, in some cases with their full-time hires, they put off the start date from July to October, but companies like Deloitte actually even paid those new entry-level hires while they were waiting to start full-time, which was just amazing. So we were really pleased to see how they adapted and that they really put our students and our graduates first to make those changes. Um, so that was wonderful. Moving forward, we have been in a lot of conversations with our employers and our recruiters. They are moving forward this summer with internships, with co-ops, with entry-level positions, um, with business as usual. If they need to stay remote, um, then they will stay remote, but um, some are ready to start bringing back their workforce. So that was a good thing. But what 2009, 2010 taught us was you can't always just count on getting on um, a website and sending in your resume and assuming you're going to get a hit or a phone call. 
networking for finding those opportunities that are not publicized or you don't know about it, believe it or not, about 80% of opportunities are found through networking connections. And I could tell you story after story of people that have made networking connections to take their next step in their career or to begin their career. Or even if you're an undergraduate student just beginning your career, it's really easy to start networking to talk to somebody who's maybe doing something you're interested in pursuing. So I know most of the people on this call are seniors, so you're probably to that point already. But um, even just talking to people about, I'm considering moving to San Francisco. Can you tell me what it's like? What's the culture like? What are the job opportunities like? So as if you're still considering what you're going to do after graduation, networking can really help. So I'm gonna do a quick review of the Alumni Career Network, and then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Lisa, and she is going to do a review of LinkedIn. Um, and all the updates on LinkedIn as well. So I am going to share my screen and please let me know if you can see this. Just give me a nod. Everybody see my screen? Okay, perfect. I did the summer send offs this year and I was doing a PowerPoint and had this link as part of the PowerPoint. And so I'm going away and doing all these great demos and everything and realized afterwards that nobody could see my screen. So I do like to check, but for those of you who are not familiar with the Alumni Career Network or Crew Connect, this is our new platform for um, the alumni directory. So you can update your information there. You also can create a profile as a student, as a faculty or staff member, or as an alum. Um, and with your profile, you can search out other members and you can connect right through this system. So it's really fantastic. And let me just give you a little bit of a demo. So here's my profile. I can upload a picture. I can upload my resume, my video, um, if I want to do a little video introduction. And if I'm a student or if I'm alum to alum or maybe graduate student to graduate student, maybe I'm a senior considering going to grad school. Maybe it would be helpful to talk to another um, grad student who's already in a program and maybe talk with, to them about how that went. But you can do a search here. And um, so let's just do, um, I'm just gonna put accounting just to make it easy. I'd like to talk to somebody in accounting. So here are all my accounting and I'm seeing I've got 285 matches. Now, some of these might be current students and maybe I would really like to talk to somebody who just made that transition from case to out there in the real world. And so I am looking at all these people and I'm seeing, let's see, I'll do some alumni 10 plus years as well. So, oh, I just saw Eric. I know Eric. Um, Eric used to be president of um, Beta Alpha Psi. So I'm going to talk to Eric. So if I click on Eric's profile, I'm going to see what he's doing. I can click here. That's going to take me right to his LinkedIn profile as well. I always remind people, do check the LinkedIn profile because people are really good about uploading their LinkedIn or um, updating their LinkedIn profile sometimes not as good about updating their alumni career network profile. So just to make sure Arid is still where Arid is working at Grant Thornton. And I can see that he's in New York and I'd love to new, move to New York and I'd love to find out more about Arid. So two things I can do, I can either send him a direct message through the system or I can schedule a call. My advice is to start with scheduling a call because think about it, if you just get a message on your cell phone, you just get a text and you really don't know anything about that person, you're a little bit more hesitant to get into a conversation or answer that. When you schedule a call, it gives you the opportunity to introduce yourself to the alum, let them know why you'd like to reach out to them. And again, even if this is alum to alum. So watch how easy this is. Click on schedule a call. Remember I said about networking being awkward, uncomfortable because we don't really know what to say. Well, the system prompts you and helps you figure out exactly what you want to say. So I would really like to talk about getting a job. Okay, now, obviously I'm not gonna ask him for a job, but 
I can say, look, I've always wanted to work in New York City. It just seems a little bit more difficult to get in there. What steps did you take to find your opportunity in New York City? So that's what I'd like to talk to them about. And then check this out. It creates the email for you. You don't even need to think about what you want to write. You just need to fill in this little part here about why you're reaching out. And it even prompts you with some career um, questions that might be good questions to ask. Or if you have your own message and you know what you want to say, you can delete all of this and type your own message. And then you're going to click on that request a call. Eric on his end will get pinged by the system. He doesn't have to be logged in. And once he logs back into the system and sees your message, the system prompts him with a date and three times. If that works for Eric, he sends those to you. And then you both select a time and dial into a conference call number at that designated date and time and have a great conversation. I really encourage you to network and talk to people. Um, even if, don't just wait to network with somebody who you think can do something for you, or you think can help you, or you think can lend you a hand up. Sometimes just networking with somebody who has nothing to do with your school, nothing to do with your major, nothing to do with the career you want, but you get talking about what you're looking to do, what you're hoping to do, and all of a sudden that person knows somebody else who has a connection and makes that connection for you. All right. So that is the alumni career network. Do you have any questions about this part of it? I'm going to show you another really good part of it too. Anybody have any questions? All right. You're also going to see communities. And so we've got a variety of communities you can create a community. I just approved one for Greek life. But for you alum that maybe are looking for another opportunity or have an opportunity and you're looking to hire, this is one of our communities and this is professional opportunities for experienced hires. So we get a lot of emails from companies saying, look, I love hiring your students, but I need somebody with 10 plus years experience how can I get the word out to them? And it is difficult and challenging sometimes to get the word out to the alum. So with this, you can add a discussion. You can look through all the discussions that are on here. So this is where we are putting those opportunities. And if you're an alum and you're looking for somebody um, who is experienced, feel free to join this community. Feel free to post positions. Um, we would love to have you as part of the community. And it's very simple. All you need to do uh, if you want to add to the discussion is just click on this little plus sign and then you can create a new topic and add that. There are also all sorts of other communities. So anything that you have an affinity towards, um, check it out, see if there's a community that you can join. If you don't see a community and you really would like it, please reach out to me um, or you can reach out to Crystal and Crystal can get the word to me and we can help you create that community and get that started. There's discussion boards, you can post events if you've got reunions coming up or anything like that. So it's really a fantastic um, uh, platform. I <laughs> had to think of that word for a minute. And again, can really, it makes networking really easy, especially when it's a little bit awkward at times, as I said. All right. Any questions before I turn it over to my colleague, Lisa? Has anybody, has, who has um, a profile on the network? Do just do the little hand thing if you don't have your screen on. Oh, that's not that many of you. All right. Well, hopefully we'll get you on there because we would love to have you part of that network and keep building it and building it. So thanks for your time. Um, I see my friend Lisa. And so I am going to let you um, introduce yourself, Lisa, and take it away. And everybody can hear me okay, right? We can... Yeah, but please introduce yourself because we did not have a chance to introduce you. 
Sure. So um, I work with CASE to help students just like Laura does with career transition. I've also been in practice on my own for about 12 years. And prior to that, I worked um, at another university in, in Missouri. And then I also worked for 30 some years or 24 years in a consulting arrangement uh, with Accenture um, uh, in doing strategy consulting. So I've got a lot of experience in helping folks with this whole idea of branding themselves and putting themselves out in the market. And especially working with a lot of folks that might be looking at career transitions. And even if you're not, I know we're gonna talk about LinkedIn and, and even if you're not looking to do a career transition, it's always good to have your LinkedIn profile up to date and, and ready to be seen by colleagues. If you're looking to be you know, brought in on an account or if you're looking to sell something, um, if you're in business development, all of these things will help if your LinkedIn profile is up to date. So we're gonna spend about uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes or so and still give us time for some questions at the end. Um, we'll go through this pretty quickly, but just kind of like Laura did too, it's show of hands or the little hand signal or put it in the chat or whatever is the easiest for you. How many people have a LinkedIn profile that they're really proud of at this point in time and feel really good about and um, think that they, <laughs> Laura, good, yes. <laughs> um, that think they, you know, they'd be happy for me to go look at it, if you will. <laughs> um, you know, show of hands, kind of some people, yes, some people no. Um, the whole, oh good, a lot of good hands holding up, so good. The idea here is that you can always make it better. It's a great tool to be able to help you um, keep up to speed and up to date. So let's kind of work on a cup, go through a couple of things and hopefully, hopefully my network will work. We won't talk a lot about the online profile management in terms of creating your brand, but it's important to make sure that your LinkedIn profile does have your brand. And it is something that people would see if they met you, they would understand if you submitted a resume, if you were if you were looking for a job, or even if you were at a, a conference or at some point a, a real life, you know, face-to-face -face conference, but even online conferences. Um, but LinkedIn is also great for the whole networking purpose of using it to connect with people and using to reach out to people. So I, again, I'm not gonna go through all these slides, but the big thing is, is that your, common, your brand needs to be common through everything. And your brand consists of all these things that you can see on the right-hand side of this document. You know, what, what's your personality? Are you an outgoing person or more introverted? What are your interests and motivators? What gets you, what, where do you get your energy from? What gets you going? Um, what qualities and soft skills? Are you empathetic? Are you more of a, um, a team collaborator or bringing people together? Hard skills and experience, those I'm sure everybody here can rattle off those pretty quickly. Those are things we typically can do really well is talk about, you know, I'm a Java programmer or I do business development or I have a PMP or whatever those hard skills are and qualities that you bring to the table. What differentiates you? That should be part and parcel of what you see in LinkedIn as well. Keep in mind, there's over 700 million people now on, on LinkedIn. So standing out, and, and this is the same on Wiser and other, you know, other ways that you want to show yourself, you want to make sure that your differentiators are kind of leading the pack here. What are your accomplishments? It's great that you do a lot of things, but most people want to know what did you accomplish? What were those results? And all of those things come together and really drive your brand. And that's what we're trying to put in front of LinkedIn. Now, LinkedIn works off of two things. And I always call about it, I, I call it the, and you've probably heard this before, but currency and relevancy. And let's first talk about currency. So currency is really about how active you are on the platform. So it's great that we've got a lot of hands up that say they have a, a profile, but if you're not active on the platform, it doesn't help you be seen, especially if you are in transition and you are hoping that recruiters will find you. Keep in mind, there's 700 million people on LinkedIn. So part of this is there's an art and a science to LinkedIn. The science part of it says you have to be active in order for your, your profile to be available for recruiters to see if they are out searching for somebody with your skill sets. So those to be active on the platform, basically it's liking and sharing and commenting, it's writing articles, it's, it's having activity on the platform itself. It doesn't take a lot of work. I tell people sometimes, you know, 10 minutes, three times a day or three times a week, rather, you can actually spend time 
liking, sharing, and commenting. And there's ways to curate your content in order to like and share and comment. And the more you do that, and the more you engage with other people on the platform, the better your search results might be if you are out looking. Um, I'm gonna try to monitor chat. Um, yes, and being sure to follow the, the companies that you're, that, you're follow, that you're interested in because those are the things that feed your feed, right? If you're liking and if you're following people, if you're following companies, following um, areas of interest through groups and hashtags and things like that, you'll get that information in your LinkedIn feed on a daily basis and you can quickly curate into the, the information you wanna like and share and comment. You also want to know that you want to, if you are actively looking, you do want to signal to recruiters that you are active in the market. We'll talk a little bit about there's two ways to signal to re, to the signal that you're open. One is only to recruiters and one is to the broader audience of, of LinkedIn. Um, and if you are looking, at least do the minimum of signaling to the recruiters because that again raises in their algorithm, the LinkedIn algorithm and the search algorithm, it raises the chances that you're gonna be picked up and looked at. The other big area is relevancy. How relevant is your profile to what people are searching for um, and to the types of jobs you might be looking for? And that's really based almost exclusively off of keywords and keyword density. Do you match to what recruiters are searching for? If you're looking to be a product manager in the high tech industry and there's not one single keyword that, uh, that aligns to product management in the high tech industry, you won't be found, right? So relevancy is key. And what we're really gonna talk about over the next slides or so is, is that relevancy factor, right? And how do you bump up your relevancy? So relevancy, um, oops, I don't know why my slides now don't wanna go forward. Let's try this again, let's see. So to really make your, your profile impactful, which is driven by, which helps your relevancy, there's a couple of key things to think about. One is having that common theme, having a constant, a consistent brand. What helps um, if a recruiter does land on your profile or somebody, um, if you're in a, in a role that you are like say in consulting and you're clients might look at your, your profile. You wanna make sure that it's clear and consistent on what it is you're about, what you do, how you do it, and again, what your accomplishments are. We wanna know that, they, that everything aligns. I don't wanna look at a profile and just say, I don't get, I don't, I don't really get, you know, what, what Hiram is trying to do out there, right? I don't understand what he's trying to do by his profile. It's all jumbled up. So you wanna have a common brand. It's gotta be clear, it's gotta be very direct because again, most people don't have a lot of time to read profiles. So even if you're picked up because of keyword density, you wanna make sure that people understand what it is that you're about when the human reader is looking at it. I always say your, your profile should be both aspirational and inspirational, especially if you're looking for a position. If you're just gonna historically tell me what you've done. It doesn't really, there's no aspiration around, I, you know, I want to move into these types of roles. I want to drive this kind of value. It, it, it can become flat and people would just bypass it. Again, you're trying to differentiate yourself. The other part is inspirational. Get people, you need people to want to read the rest of your profile or read everything that you have in there. So if, if, for example, you're a current student at Case Western, I always tell people that if all your profile talks about is being a student at Case Western, I don't get a real sense of where do you wanna go with that, right? What are you trying to do in the world with this great degree in education that you've just gotten? And showing your value through your LinkedIn profile, it's a lot easier to do it in LinkedIn than it frankly is on your resume in some ways because your resume is a little, histor mostly historical, right? And it's gonna, it's, it's one dimensional, I call it one dimensional. Um, and so it's, it's sometimes hard to, to really show that, yes, I have, you know, I might have been working for the last five years, um, you know, doing research and analytics in the healthcare market, but though, you know, it's hard to say that in, that those are skills that are really suited for any other market potentially. And what type of research did you do could be transferable somewhere else. It's a lot easier to do that inside of LinkedIn. And then obviously your experience section will support what you're trying to tell folks. And then finally, LinkedIn is looked at a lot of times. Are you likable? Do I want to have you on my team? Is there something here that says, oh, you're kind of like us and we want to talk to you? Again, this is 
geared a lot towards somebody that might be looking for a position or looking to um, elevate where they are. If you've just, you know, if you're an alumni and you've only been out a couple, three years, and now you're looking around saying, okay, it might be time for me to kind of move up, making sure your LinkedIn profile is, is, shows that aspiration, shows those capabilities is going to be critical in that process. So a couple of real tactical things that we're going to get into now, and these are some things just to keep in mind. Um, LinkedIn should be written in first person, right? Every, you've probably been told, right, your, your resume has to be written in third person or third first person narrative. Your LinkedIn profile should be written in first person. It should be like a conversation. We want to have that. We want to see the word I and me and we and our and all those kinds of things. We want to know it's about you. Uh, and there's no real limit on the length, which is good, as long as everything that's in there is, is, is digestible and readable. It'll all be picked up through search engine optimization types of algorithmic programming that LinkedIn has, but you also want to make sure that what you do put in there, you're not just using the space just to fill air, right? We want to make sure that it does have some relevancy. I mentioned that it should be aspirational, inspirational. It should also have the historical, you need to list your experiences. You need to list what you've done because those are going to drive keywords as well. You can expand your content more than you say could on a resume by using some of the other sections that we'll look at here in a second like projects, courses, patents, um, awards, honors, things like that, that sometimes might not be um, necessary for your resume, but you wanna keep it inside of LinkedIn because it is that perpetual view of you. And at some point in time, those, key, those things that you've added, that content you've added could be keyword searchable for the roles that you're looking at. It does include, oops, it does include a picture, which your resume would never do, right? That is not, that is not um, uh, copacetic. You want to make sure that your resume doesn't, but your LinkedIn profile will have a picture and it might even show some sample deliverables. It's a great area, a great way to kind of create your online portfolio, if you will. So if you are um, a, a web designer and you want to show what you've designed, you can include some of your, you know, um, your storyboards or your wire diagrams or something like that to show your work effort. If you're a data analyst, like we talked about before, you might be able to even show something that's not proprietary, but a worksheet you did in Tableau or an analysis you did in Tableau or Python or something to show that kind of work. You can attach all of that into LinkedIn. Hard to do in a resume, but easy in LinkedIn. And then, as I mentioned earlier, it is subject to keyword search and SEO principles. So you do want to make sure that you're leveraging that. You want to write for the algorithm, but you also need to write for the human because we don't want it just to be a long string of keywords. We want to, again, if you're trying to engage, I just don't need the keywords. Now, this next page is, I, I believe, um, Crystal will give you a copy of the deck, but um, I'll verify that with her because I'll send it to her afterwards. But this one page shows you all the different sections that LinkedIn has in your profile. And what's important about this is thinking through where can I put most of my effort for the biggest return on investment. And the way to look at this is the first column shows you the section or the field that LinkedIn has, then it shows you the number of characters. Then if it's a specific word search category or just a keyword search category, and then just some general notes. So you'll see stars of, on five different areas. Those are the ones that are the most important when it comes to how recruiters or, um, or others might search for you based on keywords and information. So your headline, which we'll go through all these here in a second, your headline, your about statement, your job title, your job description, and your skill section are the most, um, the highest valued searchable fields within LinkedIn. All the other ones are great. You can fill those in and you should. I mean, you, we want to see, you know, what location and we want to see your industry, that kind of thing, but they're not going to be as impactful as those other five areas. So if you are trying to update your LinkedIn in bits and pieces, start with those and then move on to the other and keep filling it out. Again, because it's perpetual, it's great. It's kind of an ongoing log of everything you've ever done, right? And you can actually make it work that way. Now, if you are 
at a company and you don't want to necessarily signal to your company that you might be out looking or you might be just updating everything because you want it to look better. Um, keep in mind that if a recruiter is out looking for you and using a recruiter search, the re recruiter search platform, um, they would never be presented your resume in their search. So if you work for Johnson and Johnson and a Johnson and Johnson recruiter is out looking for somebody to fill another job somewhere, but you just happen to have all the same skills because it would be a peer to you or somebody on your team, your resume would not be put back into their mix, if you will. Now, anybody else could search for you. So you might want to write some of your content in a way that doesn't signal directly, hey, I'm looking for a job, right? Um, yeah, Laura mentioned exactly. There's no, because there's no length limit on LinkedIn, you can put everything in there versus the one to two pages that you might do on your resume. Exactly, Laura, thank you. Now, um, to add profile sections, just so everybody knows, um, and actually, I'm going to flip over, I think, to my profile online, if that's okay. I think we have time to do that, and we can come back, and that just might show you better what I'm talking about on some of these. Let me get to my profile. So hopefully, you're now seeing my profile. Thumbs up. Yep. Okay, good. So to add um, a profile section when you're on your, your profile, you would just do the click on add a profile section, and then they're all listed here. So if I say like projects, for example, is underneath accomplishments, you would find it under there because some people won't have the same information on their profile as I do because mine's for the most part, very filled out, almost completely filled out. But a couple of other things to keep in mind, and, and I mentioned is that where your big, um, uh, where the big focal point is, if you will. So we talked about your picture. We want to see your picture. It should be your face, not you and your dog, not you and your you know, significant other, not you skiing down a mountain. Um, we want to see your face. Should be chest up, should be in professional dress. Keep in mind, it depending on what you're um, interviewing for, if you're interviewing for, you know, um, Nike, that might look different than if you're interviewing for Goldman Sachs, right? You use your cues from who you're talking with, what their websites look like, but you still want to be professional. Your background picture is this background picture where I have my logo in my, in this picture, we always encourage people to change their background picture. Some studies say you're 14 times more likely to have people stay on your profile if you have a background picture that is not the LinkedIn background picture, which a lot of people do. It doesn't, have, doesn't matter what it is, just something other than the LinkedIn default. I did mention that your, tight, your, your headline is the other major area or one of the major five major areas. And that is this section right here. You can get 120 or, sorry, 220 characters in this section. And you can add little you know, pictures and stuff and get fancy if you want. I don't know if I encourage that. I don't necessarily encourage that for a lot of folks that are out looking for jobs or might be in the working world today. I do it because of my job is different and but you can just do it. Um, you'd have to use a, a text generator to do it. it. More hassle than it's worth probably. Just know you can put 220 and it is a highly keyword searchable field. So if this area just said student at Case Western or said financial analyst or whatever, um, it really doesn't tell me that much about you. It doesn't get a lot of keyword search you know, um, juice, right? So definitely you can go in and change it. You can change it as many times as you want. Nobody really is gonna know. It will pre-populate with your most recent experience, uh, title and company, if you don't go in and edit it yourself. The other reason I suggest if you are still a student, you wouldn't have student at Case Western here because over on the right, it'll show your university that you're the most recent education university that you list and you'll have listed Case Western. So you would just, it would say Case Western and Case Western, right? Which would look kind of silly, right? So this way you can, you can get more, more bang for your buck by updating this. Now, the other um, section to think about is uh, the about, well, yeah, the, let's go to about, I'm gonna, um, yeah, the about statement. So within the about statement, there's a section called about, it used to be called the summary. You'll be able to add 2,600 characters in this section. And I encourage people to take advantage of all 2,600. Again, it's highly keyword searchable. You would write it in first person. 
Um, and we want to get to know a little bit about you, right? And about what you value, what what drives you to do what you do. But we also want to understand, we want to get keywords in there. So, and we want to be able to, um, when you're in a LinkedIn profile, there's always going to be the first three lines of your summary, and then it'll say, see more. And you want people to click on see more, right? If this is really kind of ho-hum, right? I'm a data scientist at a healthcare company, or I'm a consulting manager. I may not click on see more, but I want to be hooked into what you are and who you are. So think about what you might want to put there to get me to want to look more, right? Um, and depending on your personality, I wouldn't go overly corny or, or quirky. I would be very straightforward, very professional, but I also want to have enough interest in those first three lines to see more. And um, the other big area, you can, um, I suggest people to do things like, instead of in mind services include, I might write um, uh, uh, specific skills and capabilities, colon, and then list them because those are keywords and those are things I would be searching on. Uh, you could put in here, if you, for example, if you are in healthcare, uh, if you're doing research in the healthcare arena, but you're trying to move into research into consumer products, you could say something like, you know, my, my field is currently is researching in the healthcare market and I am, which is highly transferable into the consumer packaged goods, retail, whatever you want to say in order to get more keywords in there. But I suggest you put it into word, keep, you know, refining it, use Grammarly, make sure it's nice and tight. Um, take advantage of the 2,600 characters. And, th and if you over time decide that that's not really the message you're trying to give out, go back and edit it because you have the chance to do that. You also have a section for um, featured content. Um, it used to be part of the about section and now it's separate. And here you can add in um, uh, certificates. You can add in, um, again, presentations, pictures, awards, things that you've done that could highlight and help an employer, if you are searching, understand more about you and what you can do for them, right? And they can actually see your work. Or if you have a video, if you did a TED Talk at one point, put the video in there, That you can do that as well. So you can take advantage of the fact that you have all of this great content that you can put out there. Um, now the experience section is the other area that I mentioned is one of the major areas that you wanna make sure you take advantage of. And within experience is the title. So with, within your experience section, if you edit, you'll, the title actually you have 120 characters for your title. So you can do a lot with that because you wanna make sure that your title also is transferable in the areas that you're looking for. Some companies have different names for different things, right? So you might be called a, if you're an, an HR specialist, you might be called an HR specialist. You could do an HR specialist and then, you know, a pipe mark or a hyphen and then put, what do you do? What is your specialty? I'm an HR, spe HR specialist hyphen uh, focused on performance, benefits and recruiting or something like that. Those are three key words. If you just put HR specialist, I'm not adding more content and more searchability. So take advantage of the fact that you can update that. You can also move your experience around if you've got two things that are at present. Um, so, you know, if you've got, as long as they're ending at the same time, basically. So you'll notice that in my profile now, instead of saying Case Western, but shouldn't do that. Um, <laughs> it just needs to, I think, probably get cycled through. Um, yeah, it'll change to my company. So you can make sure that you have your most recent experience at the top. And you can add content, you can add, you know, media in these sections too, but you also get um, 2000 characters inside of your um, experience as a descriptor. So you can put bullet points, but you can also write something, right? Why did you take that position? Or what is, you know, not only your accomplishments and your bullet points, but just talk about, you know, what is it that you bring to the to the table specifically in that position? Or why did you make a transition? This is all keyword searchable. Again, you're trying to leverage your keyword searchable searchability. And break up the content, just don't make it one big, you know, big paragraph because that'll just drive people crazy. Um, and skills, I'll say the next big area I wanted to reference is because that's an area that people forget about. You can list 50 skills 
And you would want to make sure that you have as many, I would use all 50, because again, they're keyword searchable. To add a skill, you can, you would just click add a skill and you would type in if you wanted to do like they've got data, something, right? You're just trying to find something that has data in it. Um, you can start looking at, okay, here's all the things they have for data. You can also add your own skill. I don't recommend adding a skill that's not listed already because it just, anything that's listed means that that's a keyword search that people have been doing. If you add a skill that's obscure, you're just, you know, taking away from the 50 that you have available to you, the 50 keyword searches. And the other big thing within the skills and endorsement, I only see the top three after you populate them all. And you want to make sure that you pin your most important top three, because that's what I see right away. It doesn't affect searchability, but I see this right away. So go ahead and pin your top three, and then you can move those around inside right? Anywhere where you see that stacked bar, that kind of that stacked bar icon, that just means you can move things around. LinkedIn buckets all the rest of these skills based on what they consider that to be. So if it's industry knowledge, it could be technical skills, interpersonal skills. You can't force it into one of these categories. You can change the order inside this category, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I had one client that was very um, concerned that it wasn't alphabetical and you could do that if you wanted to, but it doesn't really drive anything. Um, so that the skill area is the other big area that I suggest that people take advantage of. The other big thing with you have really technical skills, you can get a skill badge through LinkedIn and recruiters are using skill badges now to highlight because I could go in there and put in a code or put in a skill that I do Java programming, which would be ridiculous. And I could take um, a, a skill badge, a skill assessment and get a badge for it if I really could do it. And then I would elevate myself in any of those profiles. Now I'm going to switch back to the presentation because I want to show you quickly how recruiters see your um, profile when they are searching. Um, and I know I went through that a lot fa pretty fast, but if a recruiter is actually looking for somebody and does a recruiter search with their algorithm, sets up their keywords, this is what they might be returned, right? So they get kind of a high level view, a summary of what, what you are. And so you can see why, even if, I, if I'm returned to, this, to the recruiter, why it might matter what my, my headline is, right? Or if I have a picture, more than likely I would stop and I would look and I might actually click on this person, right? If I don't have that much information, I may not actually click on them. I may, just, I may just scroll past through that. Now you can see this is a really bad example in some ways because I only used a couple of keywords, but what'll happen is once the recruiter searches, if they use the word MBA, if they use St. Louis, if they used Washington, in this case, it was a Washington University search, um, those are the words that are picked up, right? So had I searched for business strategy, those would be other words that would be picked up. So that's how a recruiter finds you and nails kind of what your skills are that you're bringing to the party. So another big thing that people talk a lot about is like, once I have my profile ready to go, who should I connect with? How do I find the right contacts? Um, that's a big part of like figuring that out is like, how do I reach out and use my, my tools? So there's some approaches and tips here and, and you can look at those later when we send out the deck. But I wanna make sure that you realize that inside of, of LinkedIn, there is a way to search based on not only using Wiser, but now if you're using LinkedIn, you can search for alumni at Case Western based on where they live, where they work, what they work on. And you can find people that connect with you based on the searches you do. So this is a search that shows that we're 58,000 people that you, you are connected with and you are probably those people that raise their hand, you are one of these 58,000 people. Um, so the idea is you're already connected based on your alumni status, even if you don't know them and you, you need to take advantage of that. Um, so the other thing is you can use Boolean searches. If you're not familiar with that, you can go into LinkedIn and it'll give you a Boolean search tutorial, but and or not and parenthetical searches to actually search for people based on a longer string than just where do they live. And this helps a lot if you're if you are trying to find a contact that says I want somebody that's doing HR specialty in a certain company that went to Case Western, right? Or if you're getting your graduate degree at Case, then do it for your undergrad. 
And you can see each time you do more of a, you know, a search in this case, the first one was seven, 700 million people Then I did VP, but not SVP Then I did corporate finance. And so you can see how you can start to kind of limit or get down into just a few people to look at 25,000, 250,000 is still too many, but you can actually get pretty far down into the, by using filters. Um, I'll leave it there because there's a lot of it. I mean, we could go on forever on this stuff, but just know that LinkedIn, I will tell you is that is, is if you're not leveraging that to connect with people for, for jobs, if you're transitioning, you should be, you should also just be looking and keeping active in it because at some point you may want to, or someone might be looking for you, for you to help someone else. And so it's always good to be able to pay it forward and take advantage of that. But there's, there's tons of content on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I, as Laura knows, we could do this for hours and we have, but you don't want that. So any questions for me, let me know, um, email me, um, whatever. I'd be happy to try to answer them. All right, does anybody have any questions for Lisa now or me? All right, thanks, Sarah. Yeah, alum, if you're on here and you're willing to connect with each other or students, um, feel free to put that in the chat. Thanks, Sarah, that was great. I have a quick question. Sure. Hmm. So is more or less better when it comes to LinkedIn in terms of like listing past experiences? Is it better to sort of, you know, keep like a running tab of all relevant things or should you start to pare down if you have, you know, past experience that maybe isn't as relevant to your current field? So with LinkedIn, because there's no limit, you can, I say, include as much as you want. I mean, some people even include high school experiences, all your volunteering. I, I do suggest you do that as long as uh, keeping in mind that it, you want it to also be relevant um, because if, a, and you can also hide some things, right? You can list it, but hide it, not show it to the, not make it visible. And you could do that as well. Sometimes if you have too much in there that would confuse a human reader, it won't impact the searchability, but if it confuses the human reader, then if you leave it in there, just use the description to say more about why you did it or why you transitioned out of it, right? Which could also be helpful, right? Because someone might click on an experience and go, oh, that's really interesting. She was a biomedical researcher and then moved into, you know, performance management technology or something. It's like, whoa, how did that happen? You can explain it inside of LinkedIn. I say use more. I say more is better for the most part. I don't know what you think on, on that, Laura. Um, yeah, I think as long as it's relevant, um, and again, um, you know, that you're not going back 15, 20 years, unless it's, it's relevant, you know, if you work at the same accounting company for 20 years, and now you're switching over, then absolutely keep that on. But yeah, that's the beauty. Again, with resumes, we really don't want to go beyond a page, page and a half, maybe two, if you've got a PhD and, and you're doing a CV. But LinkedIn, and especially if you're still a student, um, projects, group things that you've done in class, all of that can go on LinkedIn. And that is really relevant to a prospective employer. So yeah. absolutely put it, put it all on there. And then in your heading on your resume, something that's changed. Um, so typically a few years ago, I would tell you, put your address on there so the employer knows where you are. Again, in all our discussions with employers, one of my employers said, you might want to tell people to start, start leaving their address off their resume because mm -hmm. there is address biases. Yeah. Um, so if I am in California and I'm recruiting and I have a local candidate and somebody who's in Texas, uh, maybe the one in Texas is a little bit better, but then I've got to pay for the relocation and do all those added, added expenses. So maybe I'll go with the local guy. Mm -hmm. All right. So right now they're just saying name, email, phone number, and I would put your LinkedIn hyperlink. Yeah. One other thing too, that Laura mentioned with projects, you'll know that there is a project section and a course section inside of the accomplishments on LinkedIn. If you are listing projects, I tell you to list them as experience, not as a project because projects aren't searchable. 
courses, that section inside of LinkedIn are not searchable. So if you did this major data, data analytic project and consulting project and listed under projects, it wouldn't get counted in the keyword search. So listed under experience. The case alumni page. Um, I think that was Laura that posted it or Crystal. I was just telling Kelly, Kelly said she's moving back to Cleveland. And I said, make sure you join the <clears throat> Cleveland chapter Facebook page because they do all their events and all their updates and stuff. And if you're, you know, definitely wanting to reconnect and welcome back home or back to Cleveland. I don't know if this is home or not, but basically it is home. <laughs> we went to school here. That's great. So, Laura, there, there is one question about posting the case alumni page. Can you guys do that again for them? I don't have the link open. Oh, Otherwise, Wiser? I... Yes. Yes. Yeah, Wiser. Yeah. Yep. Hold on one second. I will put that link in. It's okay. Oh, gosh. I can try to get it if you don't have it. I have to sign out because it does the admin one. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to put this in the chat. Just bear with me for a second. Okay, here I come. I put it. I got it, Laura. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mine always comes up admin, so. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, that Wiser platform was um, developed by one of our alum, John Knifik. So very, very cool to have that connection as well with it. So, all right. Well, that does it for Lisa and myself. Crystal or Hiram, did you wanna wrap it up? Um, so I just, my name is Crystal Crosby. I'm the Assistant Director of Student Young Alumni and Affinity Programs of the Alumni Association of CWRU. And I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, hopefully this is something that is usable, something that has, um, I know I've gained a wealth of information about LinkedIn. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, there will be a recording of this training um, posted to our website in about a week or so. Um, so that if you ever want to go back and get some nuggets, um, some of those tips that Lisa and both Porsche um, shared, feel free to. Um, if you're looking to follow us on social media, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, just search CWRU alumni. I'm the same thing with, um, and that's great. And I hope to see you at another event. If you have any questions or if there's anything else that we can kind of put you in touch with, um, be sure to um, email us at alumni relations at case.edu. Um, thank you, Lisa. Hear it for um, that great presentation and insight on LinkedIn. Thank you, Laura Papcom um, from the Career Center for really helping us put this together. And thank you, Hiram Cortez um, from the Latinx Alumni Association for being here to introduce us and to introduce and um, setting up this, helping us out this evening. So thank you. Have a great evening. Please be safe. And like I said, let us know if you need anything.